No introduction can do Tom Maine any justice. In 19, so I've divided the introduction into three parts. Facts, past, and my personal introduction to Tom. So in 1972, he was one of Sarek's founding faculty, and within the same year, he co-founded Morphosis. He has taught at more than eight architecture schools, published over 25 monographs, has received 25 Progressive Architecture Awards and over 100 American Institute of Architecture Awards, among many others, including the Pritzker Architecture Prize. Part two, the past. I'm going to read an abbreviation, which is slightly paraphrased, of a 1975, sorry, 1979 lecture introduction by Frederick Fisher for Tom here at Syrac. He said, Tom Main has a commitment to architecture and unselfishly the development of the field. He has had a discouraging word from just about everybody, yet we can see the product of his commitment and we are all indebted to that. He seems to be able to pick up awards just about at will and it reflects a set of standards and a degree of skill and commitment to architecture. Tom's degrees, awards, exhibits, and publications that he has had in the short history of Morphosis are an index of that. The office was only seven years old at the time of that introduction. Who wrote that? Frederick Fisher. Really? Can I have that when you're done? Of course. I never remembered it, and I don't see Fred that much, although it's a longer story. I was on the jury that, when he went to the Rome Academy. And had never, I'd been working flat out for 40 years, and I don't <laughs> keep track of stuff. <laughs> it's just, uh, huh. And part three, my personal introduction to Tom. 79, I had to start a building. Yes. I built one building, yeah. How many buildings have you built? Do you know the statistics for that? How many buildings you've built? 40. Part three, my personal introduction to Tom. There is really no way to describe what Tom has done for us here at SIRE from then until now. For the architecture community here in Los Angeles, the overall architecture education, and at a much larger scale, his influence on the built environment. SIRE and Morphosis are some of the many classrooms he has helped create over the years. If we were to define a classroom today, it would be any room that Tom Main is in. During a seminar at SIRE, Tom stated, you're young ask the wrong questions, make the wrong moves, learn from them, it's your opportunity to do so. So hopefully Tom will excuse any naive questions or assumptions during this interview. Thank you so much for your time, it's a great honor to sit down with you to today. Tom's class is now in session. <laughs> My pleasure. Um, could you take us back to what you consider was your first project? The first project. It's interesting because the um, the environment uh, when I came out of school in 68 was um, so different and that this country was experiencing um, somewhat of an upheaval, let's say. And there were these um, things in play. There, was, there were these issues, cultural, political, social. The, um, the Vietnam War, which I was um, not interested in participating in, and it was something that preoccupied you as a young as a 19, 18 year old man. Uh, there was the, um, of course, the, the a complete shift in the, it was the beginning of gender and the feminist movement. It was in the middle of civil rights. There was an explosion culturally within film, within art, etc. And they, um, in some way, overpowered the, um, the particular architectural aspect of your education. And then coming out of school, and, and, and in parallel to that was the, <clears throat> was the um, more or less the end of modernism, was the um, exhaustion, let's say, of the modern project. And um, schools were looking for a new direction, and I was part of that. At USC, which was the heart of modernism, with um, many, many top architects, was going through a change. And, and I started with a person that had taken over the school named Ralph Knowles, and it was, um, systems theory, analysis, synthesis, very rational, etc. But they were searching their way through. But very much got me involved in um, a broader look of the forces that produce architecture and very much connected to the natural environment, to what now becomes a standard interest in the ecological issues, etc. 
And, um, but you left with more questions and, and preoccupations of what architecture could be than what it was. And I think because of that, a lot of us uh, were more situated for urban design planning than we were architecture, because there was no formal at all, nothing. Quite couldn't be the more opposite of what's going on today. Uh, and then I went to work um, for the redevelopment agency as a, as a planner. And then um, from there, I went to uh, Gruen Associates. And Gruen was at that time a hot house. It was probably the most intellectual, conceptual. Victor had brought every thinker there, et cetera. And it was a very interesting place. And a lot of people, Frank came out of there, 12 people. A lot of people came out of Gruen at that era. And then um, I was asked by Jim Stafford, another one of the founding members, um, to come out to Pomona. And I just, by coincidence, Sunday, this is not going to be for, my wife was going through a whole box of old documents. For, she was just doing house cleaner. And she came across my first contract for the, a summer session at, at, at Pomona. And it was, um, it was a, for the complete summer semester and it was $3,200 <laughs> total salary, not a month. It's like $1,000 a month. And we were laughing. And I, I actually just scanned it at my office. I'm going to put it up on the wall. And uh, I started teaching. And then that year, um, Jim and I, because we both came out of SC, and I didn't meet him at SC. I met him through the redevelopment agency. We were working together. Um, we're teaching together. And we're reinvestigating a lot of the work we were doing through dynamic form making with, that we'd come out of with SC with Ralph Knowles. And, um, and that was the year everything blew up and uh, all of us were fired. And um, it's funny, people talk about it differently. I thought that we were all fired. It was really fascinating. Because that's, it was an upheaval that many schools go through, not unusual, right? And, but it included the chairman, which was Ray. And, um, got together under Ray's leadership. He was a generation older. I'm 27 years old. Uh, Ray would be 41 or two or something. Um, discussing the potential starting a new school, which would be today preposterous. Define 41, they were all seniors, including Rotundi, um, that are willing to leave their last year of school at an accredited program and go with six people and say, oh, let's start a school. I mean, it was crazy, right? It did it. And um, it not only succeeded, but kind of took off. Um, we all worked um, pro bono. Um, five years later, six years later, we had 100 people in the school, and the rest is history. It just kept growing. And um, that same year, Jim and I started Morphosis. And, um, the two are completely intertwined. Uh, we didn't start an office in any strategical way or as a business. We started it as an idea. No work, no clients, just morphosis. And it was um, from the beginning, we were interested uh, having to do with both of our preoccupations in um, a broader idea of an architectural office. It was more. Um, broad-reaching graphics, urban design, architecture, interior design, and um, we immediately got some graphic contracts, et cetera, and there was a little bit of work that kept us going, and they were doing competitions, et cetera. And um, the, the young people in the office would have been our students at CyArk, and the two were mixed. And I look back, and it didn't, it, we were, the whole 70s were thinking, essentially. There's very little work coming out of the office, it was work. We're um, coming out of school with, with no agenda and kind of the collapse of this incredibly powerful thing that took place in the 20th century, the modern movement. We're trying to figure out what are we going to do? What is our, what is our generation's um, contribution to the practice of architecture? And the 70s, we're, um, we're exploring, and it's random. We're looking at the Tedenza and rationalism, we're, we're, we're still, I'm enamored with Archigram. Uh, they had just showed up at UCLA in 1968, my last year at school, and I was hanging out at UCLA. And um, we're looking everywhere. And um, it's not till the beginning of the 80s that we start producing work, and I go back to school. I'm running the grad program at SciArc. 
uh, I forgot, but the accreditation committee kind of dinged me because I didn't have a graduate degree. So uh, the, the school gave me a sabbatical and I went to Harvard for a year to, to get my grad degree so I could retake over the, the grad program. And it was also for me a retooling, to just rethink and trying to figure out who I was as an architect. And, um, but that I can realize now, looking back, that set up a lifelong framework for teaching and my pedagogical objectives and my work in, in the academy with my practice. Because today, in a very different way, I have the same construct. And um, like we were saying earlier, part of my office is a postgraduate school or a pre-graduate school. And I know when young people come to me, um, in two or three years, they're going to either say, I'm heading to grad school, and it's not at all a surprise. I go, I, I was waiting for you to, to talk to me, right? And um, they want a letter, and they've worked there, and they're going to go to um, one of the six best schools in the country. They're, they have high ambitions. They, expe they have high expectations. And um, I know that's going to happen. Or they've been with me for between six and 10 years, and they're going to go out and start their own practice. Second. And so when I'm invited out to lunch with, with these guys, I already know, I go, okay, uh, school, which one? And now I can kind of give my two cents of, eh, I would look at Harvard versus MIT or, or Princeton or the, versus who you are, what you want, or et cetera, et cetera. Over now, we're talking um, 30 years. Or big hug, kiss and bull cheeks, good luck. Uh, I don't have to tell you what a tough, really motherfucking difficult, you can take that out of your profession this is, but you've been around, we have a very transparent office, everybody knows everything. <clears throat> if there's difficulties with work at any level, they know it, it's not hidden from them. <clears throat> you've seen my office, it's completely transparent. I sit out in the office like everybody else. <clears throat> they hear our phone calls. And, um, and so you know what you're getting into, best of luck. And, um, join the whatever, the 55 or 60 people that have, that have done this over 40 years time. And, um, and I really love that, that I realized that um, I have a very kind of unique little environment that I've established and I've developed a, uh, an institution on its own right. And um, I, also, I think it has a lot to do with who I'm as an architect, I don't think I'd separate myself from certain, especially the whole star architecture thing. Um, the work is never about Tom Main. The work comes out of Morphosis and it comes out of my leadership, but it has to do with huge amount of design intelligence that goes into it. And I make no claim of being the genius architect. In fact, I have no belief in that. Didn't from day one. When Jim and I decided to call ourselves Morphosis, it was a subtle attack or a critique on kind of the singular genus man concept of architect. And we saw from the beginning, <clears throat> architecture is much more dispersed, meaning urban design, graphics, other, <coughs> other areas of design. <coughs> and we saw it as a collective act. And in that sense, I was definitely looking at Archigram and Super Studio and Hans Rucker and people that were definitely influencing me at the time. And there were, um, there were collectives and they were not using names. And um, I think I've grown into that. Yeah, that we're more that way today than we were from the beginning. You talk about the idea of an architect is the ability to neg negotiate between private thoughts with a more public audience. Mm. Could you describe how that translation worked? Mm. There, there was a. It, be, it, begin, it begins as the nature of your projects change from the private to the public. So more or less through even the 80s, I'm doing small commercial work like all young architects, cafes, residential projects, etc. And they're still um, wrapped up in the formal design, and they don't have huge issues, cultural, social, environmental, infrastructural, et cetera, environmental. And um, although uh, environmental, we dug them in the ground and we did certain things, but still. 
as we moved into the public sector, first through the educational Diamond Rancher, then through federal projects, complete shift. And um, it was one that was purposeful and that I was interested in because I'm now dealing in work which has um, huge implications, um, political, cultural, social, environmental, urban, etc. And I can make some commentary on shaping my environment within terms that belong to a broad discourse that are not mine privately. And that what came out of that was a clear separation of what belongs to us as architects and what belongs to my client group or society as a project that's bigger than I am. And it'd be more if you were looking at, um, I'd compare myself to an evolutionary biologist. You're not working under your terms. You're working with a broad project that's shared by other environmental biologists that have to do with the phenomena of predictable cellular behavior, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm very much believe in that, that the project is bigger than me, and I'm dealing in society's problems. And then I get to interpret them, to translate them into a language. And now that's my territory. And I've gotten, I think, more sophisticated and um, better at articulating that problem with client. This is what I do for you, and I make it work. And I not only make it work, but I put it on um, certain political, ethical terms. If it's energy, we're going to make it state of the art, and I want to be aligned with Elon Musk. If it's urban, I want to be, again, part absolutely of something that deals with, with um, advanced urban social behavior, et cetera. And I can go around to my client group, and uh, my job is to solve the problem. And then within functionality and use, et cetera, whether it's a medical or a, an educational facility, no, my job is to make it work to the most micro detail. Um, delivery services and services of all types, and that's my job as an architect. What I get to do is I get to shape the, 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 the um, the physiognomic, the, the, the shaping of the, of the physical environment. And um, with that comes, at times, rethinking the functional programmatic stuff, which then they get. By the way, if we did this, would it be interesting for you to rethink how behavior happens? Because I'm interested in um, the development of um, the reshaping of things in a behavior sense. but. I have to understand it within the terms of the particular project that are understood by the client. Make sense? Yes. And um, I don't think there's any other choice if you're interested in operating at a certain scale. We're working on a, um, the, the embassy in Beirut right now, an incredibly complicated project, huge, huge project. We never talk design to the client, never. The design just shows up. I talk about huge client, 40, 50 people. Um, security, um, living and housing, um, um, diplomatic services, on and on. Each one of them, um, I have to have a team that can respond to solving the project. So I have to be able to get um, everybody out of the building in X minutes with four helicopters. And when I'm talking to the defense guy, that's all he cares about. He doesn't give a shit of what it looks like. And he should. That's his job, right? And um, what it looks like is the result of these enormous numbers of, of programmatic demands, of performances, right? And, um, and the conversation is, yes, we take care of you, and that is our territory. And it's quite seldom in today's world that there's too many people that are aesthetic advisors, right? And um, we've already gotten there because somebody wants design. We wouldn't be at the table. And after that, um, we don't need or expect micromanagement, right? Once we can solve the problem, we're the ones that shape it. And uh, there's this incredibly clear, clear division at that, that, which is very, very different in little projects, where you go back to a small project and, and the major element still might be the, the, the thing and what it looks like, right? And uh, a huge difference between scale. And it definitely happens as, as your office grows and you shift the scale 
into a certain level of complexity, right? That, re that requires that kind of thinking. Super interesting. Uh, you make a crucial point um, previously that there, you segregate problems into architecture problems versus non-architectural problems, such as political, social, or cultural is something you've discussed. Should it or can architecture cross these boundaries to deal with much broader topics? Set it, set it Segre uh, segregating problems into architectural problems versus non-architectural problems, such as the political, social, or cultural, is something you've discussed before. Should or can architecture cross these boundaries to deal with much broader topics? Oh, they have to. Yeah. Um, when I'm discussing the, this, this conversation of um, performance versus aesthetics, um, I'm trying to make it clear in a conversation but they're not separate conversations. They're completely connected and they cross over. And what can happen as you rethink various levels of performance, say within even straight functional terms, as you reinvent the nature of performance, say uh, today, uh, a shift in the importance of transparency and communication, which is touching all academic um, business environments this place we're in today with the glass walls where I can see the people here. Um, if you discuss the nature of that, it leads to different architecture. So in, in all the conversations, quote, pragmatic, or the broad in these, these areas, that you're also using the same creative process, you're rethinking always, you're always challenging, going, hmm, if we're thinking in contemporary terms, how do we think about all of these performances in contemporary terms that leads to design? And the other one, you're, you're coming at it from a design point of view, and it's taking place within another territory that invents things that are sans programmatic, that at the same time rethink program. And so the, the two are completely connected. But I think what would be most important is that you're bringing the same um, heuristic, the the, 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 the process of questioning and challenging and um, interrogating problems to both areas. Make sense? And that's why finally they do this. And in fact, I would say the, defini the definition of architecture is literally the, um, the synthesis of um, performance and aesthetics, where it's the social act and the aesthetic act come together. That is architecture versus sculpture, music, film, Name it, right? That is the essence. And it's why um, I think architecture as an art form is so unusual. It demands left, right, instantaneous, moving back and forth synaptically, because you're moving from one world, which can be ultimately immensely pragmatic, to the other one, which is an invent inventive world of your brain and how you, where it takes you. And um, it's maybe the most difficult part, and it's also the most interesting because it's so demanding in a way that some, um, especially as you get older, you realize it's quite unusual. But the demand part is interesting for you as it keeps pushing you. It's, and it's, it's ultimately not achievable. And one of the things that it's, it's so clear about architecture, there is no end. You'll never get it. It's an endless search for something that keeps changing. And there's no such thing as perfection. Which again, I think Jim and I early on came out of a generation, a generation that had no interest in utopia. We, we were actually much more connected to dystopia, imperfection. I've been fascinated with um, randomness, imperfection, found, found objects my whole life. Because I, um, I have no interest in any idea of, of something complete, finished, or ideal. I find that absolutely absurd that the world operates provisionally, and it's the, um, the continual change, which is so exciting. And they give you something to, something to do and think about continuously. It's a never-ending kind of process. At a time where there are a lot of architects withdrawing from their involvement and interest in the urban, your interest in large-scale problems of policy and complexity have had an inverse relationship to that. They've, it's gone up. Uh, how can architects deal with architecture beyond the end of Hmm. Isn't it? I think that's the problem. That architecture is reduced, it keeps shrinking its interest. All the surfaces. 
it's an aspect of the work, and I'm, I have a whole gang that specializes in, I have an office of 70 people, and I have a gang that does scripting and surface development, and that's what they do. That's not architecture. That's a little piece of architecture. Maybe, in some cases, one of the more dominant. In many cases, not at all. Doesn't even necessarily exist. Um, problematic to reduce architecture to a surface is absolutely absurd. Um, I'm interested in it. It couldn't be more the opposite of expanding the rules of architecture <clears throat> that are finally um, connected to the broadest urban infrastructural environmental thinking that challenge social, cultural, political status. If you're not shaping the world at that level, we're going to be decorators. And I had to say no interest in that whatsoever. And um, it's the obligation <clears throat> of the architect and his own professional position, and it's the obligation of our universities, our educational facilities, to, um, to expand and to connect architecture to something meaningful that's other than a conversation amongst ourselves. And there's nothing wrong with those conversations. They're vital and important, but we understand we're talking about an enormously few amount of people that speak a certain language that most people don't even have any knowledge of or care about. And the connected tissue has to do with what's interesting in the world. Um, my students, I have read the, what comes over an iPhone of the New York Times. Come on, if, if you don't understand the world on global terms, I was just lecturing in New Mexico. And, they were asking me why, but they were challenging me like I knew what happened. Little town, big town, what does your work have anything to do with our town and the way we live? And I'm going, well, you have not a clue. You're like inventing something. You think because you, you, you live in a little town that you live in a different world than I am, you're imagining. You live in exactly the same world I do that has the same forces. So when the stock market goes down or China goes bust or certain things are happening at a macro level of the world, they affect you just like they affect this absurd. You live in a global economy, political structure, et cetera, a cultural structure, et cetera, et cetera. You just want to make believe that you can live in a little desert house and you don't have that. Nonsense. We, we all live in, a, the same, in the same world and, it, and today it's a connected, radically connected world within all spheres, right? And it's global. And, and, or there's a dialogue that you can articulate between mi micro and macro. There's aspects that you do get living in your little village, but finally there's other larger ones that come from the global. And um, again, that has to be part of pedagogy. That has to be part of our, we can't be shrinking down and all of a sudden a skin. Uh, uh, 10 years ago, you'd give that as a project and you'd get little shapes and colors and stuff. Today, I'm gonna ask, um, how many of these are produced? And the answer is going to be like uh, 7 billion, just Starbucks, just in the US in one year. Hmm, what do you do with them when they're done? They get in a dump. How big is that? It's a, it's a kilometer by a kilometer square, and it has a shelf life of 50 years. Different set of questions. Do we need another shape? Is it even important, much less a skin, right? And then, by the way, the skin, the little lines, we're going to redesign that line, and you, you get the skin guys. They're going to give all little ideas. And you go, no, 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 no. The first problem is what's it made out of? And how much does it cost? How many are there again? Does it get reused, right? And I think in today's world, again, I'm going to, I'm going to look at a Musk or a Gates or a Steve Jobs. Um, you ask questions in a completely different way as a designer. And, and of course, as a designer today, um, Again, in, in, in teaching, I'm more interested in developing thought leaders than designers. Because today, um, I just got a Tesla. Um, the design is completely secondary to the car. It's okay. Nice design. Is it the main idea for the car? Absolutely not. In fact, it kind of looks like a BMW or a Mercedes because he didn't want it to be a negative. Is he selling it on the design idea? Absolutely not. He's selling it on a, a complete radical change of what an automobile is. And you drive that car, and you have to relearn what it means to drive because he's completely changed it. There's no key, there's no on button, there's a forward and reverse. Um, you sit in the car and the lights go on. Nothing happens if they push on the pedal. 
you know, a, a map bigger than your computer. Um, you sit in the car in the morning, your calendar comes up, whatever's on your iPhone. Like right now, uh, when I get out of here after whatever it's going to be, an hour, an hour and a half, um, it'll be like 100, I'll turn my, I'll turn my app on. There it is. Charging, inter telling me that my charging just got interrupted. And that's my car. And I have 163 miles left on my charge. And they tell me where it's parked. It's at 760 something, 3rd Street. And um, if I push climate, it's 103 degrees. And before I leave here, I'll push on climate control. And it'll start cooling the car. So when I get out there, it won't be 110 degrees and the steering wheel won't burn my arms. Right? It's... It, it's... He just started over. You look at the frame, it comes this high off the ground. Um, it's faster than a Porsche, and it's a sedan. It goes on and on. If I drive it properly, I don't use the brakes. That's how we think today. And we don't start with what... You don't even start with what it looks like. The look, the physiognomic, what do you want to call it, is a derivation of its performance in the broadest sense. Performance and functionality, performance environmentally, performance socially, culturally, politically, etc. And um, the, your your facility, your um, the skill you bring to the interpretation is what we do as architects. But it, it, but, it's, but it's a result of, right? It's not the primary driver. What does designing in terms of materials, minerals, what you call inert matter, mm. and not human scale? bring to the discussion of buildings? Mm, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I saw that, and I didn't know what you were driving at. It's funny, um, every architect decides the kind of questions they want to ask. And the difference between, this might be coming out of your interviews, it's not, people tend to make differences between us by what the buildings look like. And again, that's a result of something. The difference is the kind of questions we ask that lead us to those. That's the difference. And I've been interested in um, certain ideas, um, organ organizational, urban, um, notions of connectivity, um, relationships of how things interrelate. And, um, and I haven't been particularly interested in the role of material in terms of uh, state of the art or the whole notion of the importance of the materiality as a facade, which would go back to the facade people maybe. And so I've tried to keep the, the, the work, and it's been performance-driven, and it's been driven by uh, um, financial, the, the, the economics of the building. And, and I've had, in my whole career, very modest budgets. And I worked in this country, and, and they're, they're, I have to compete with, it, it's complicated, modest um, um, situation. The, um, and so I've chosen, kind of default, I try to take it out of the equation, um, concrete, wood, steel, complete generic materials, and you're not looking at something and it's not about uh, state of the art, and in some way it's um, probably conceptually connected to, I'm still connected to the old school of transcendence, something that's going to be there 25 years from now. I'm taking my office to the, the Crawford House and it's 25 years old. And there's nothing that's kind of out of date because of that, because it's just generic steel, concrete, wood. And I'm interested in that in terms of, um, I guess, the, again, like a longevity that the building materials are ephemeral and they're going to they're gonna change instantly. And um, anyway, it's been, it's been a, and it's also like I haven't used much color. Um, it's just a, a, a thing that, it's another variable I don't want to work with. I have enough variables on the table, and it's just, it's a, it's a self-imposed limit. Although our building in Cornell, we, we did that, everybody goes, oh. Uh, even the client goes, whoa, this is like, you ever use color? I've never seen this before. And, uh, but it was something we thought out that we could talk about 
and it had to do with climate, it had to do with a particular nation, this building, et cetera. But it's, um, it is more with this uh, setting up your own limits. I'm going to deal with these things, and after that, they're arbitrary. It's also, I guess, um, it's an attack on arbitrariness. I try to, um, in my own intuitive way, there is usually there's a rationale behind our work that I can pass on, and it's also been connected to teaching that I think a lot of people can understand our buildings because they're understandable because they're not all in private terms. You think so? Yeah. That they can look at the work and they, they understand there's a system at work and the system is definitely not overly mechanized, but they can still take something from it. It's not totally private. And um, again, color to me is a completely personal thing and I, that's another kind of reason I think I gotta stay away from it. Talking about intuition and rationale, how does both your past and current abstract drawings and models, the beautiful models you have at Moses, affect the way in which you think about your work? Um, we're going to go back to the 70s now <clears throat> and 80s, uh, kind of forming ideas of what architecture is. And um, we're thinking visually, and we're developing a visual literacy, let's say. And, um, we're starting to do that in the 70s, and we're drawing, we're drawing in a particular way, or we're starting to invent ways of drawing that rep reflect our ways of thinking. And then in the 80s, we take off, and we're building some stuff, but we're um, really conscious now that the output of the office is work through drawings and models, that that's our output of our intellectual creative activity because we're only building little pieces of stuff. And as young architects, our output is still ideas. And those ideas are manifested through these things. And um, I remember talking, and I think it's probably in my lectures, it was very clear, and I was discussing how these models and the drawings were both autonomous and connected. They're both part, they're, they're not completely separate from architecture, they are connected to the work, but at the same time, I saw them as autonomous things on their own. And, um, the Sixth Street drawings were, were a project, and they were the project, we even talked about um, constructing the drawings. We were constructing, right? And, uh, and there, even the presence of materiality on them, all that came from that idea. And um, it was our work. It was our research that led to work in the future. I just did a new set of drawings. I went back, I haven't done it for 20 years, and I've, I've been working on it for three years, and I just finished them. Um, you should come by and take a peek. And um, they're having it. I'm realizing I was missing that research, and that uh, immediately found its way into the work, just like this. And uh, again, um, I think visually, as well as in traditional terms, and um, the drawings and models you're talking about are the output of the, of the thinking, and they're um, they both right have their own private terms and they, are, they, 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 they touch architecture. I love this comment you made. Um, you said your thinking shifted when you were introduced to the idea of subtraction as a design tool. How has that shifted the void solid relationship in your projects? When I, when I when, is it when you talked about when you were introduced to the idea of subtraction as a design tool, when you were looking at architects that subtracted. Oh, subtraction. subtraction. You said passion. Oh, I remember that question. Where did you see that? Where did you get that? Um, you were talking about, I believe it was a Spanish architect who dug. Oh, digging. Yeah. Because subtraction, again, uh, I came out of, of, of my undergraduate education with no formal knowledge at all. It was crazy. It was computers and various analytical stuff. And um, I started, Jim Stafford was in the school two years earlier than me and had the traditional program. He introduced me to Corbusier, and we used to draw and trace the Secretariat. And at that point, I realized, oh, this is interesting, because I was, at the time, very interested in Sterling, and he's an additive guy. And Corbusier was a subtractive guy, and I, I, I thought that that's what you're going for. And I know I said, no, no, I became more of that pretty early. No, I got interested in uh, digging, and it was through um, my introduction to uh, Raymond Abraham and, and Peachler, and um, it was a, actually it was, probably I could put a date on it. It was somewhere mid, 
early mid 80s and it was a show at Leo Castelli on Architects and I became aware of um, Lebius who I hadn't met yet and I became aware of uh, Raymond Abraham and I became aware of uh, Pichler who's the kind of the founder of a lot of this and they were all diggers and I think maybe somewhere there I was aware of Ambaz and if you look at his early projects he had a series of earth projects that are kind of graphic but they're digging actually uh, um, uh, I think the drawings were done by Mark Mack and um, that stuck with me. Uh, and you'll see our first projects. And again, I think when you're starting, you're very unconscious of the stuff. Stuff seeping in. And, but if you look at the Lawrence house, the thing that's maybe the most interesting is it carves into the site and then it keeps carving. It's on like 24 different levels. Every room is on its own level. And then we get to the little house of Venice 3 and we dig again. And it goes down on the ground. And somehow that notion, it was, at this time, it's just instinctual. Um, a little bit to do with the material. It's somehow kind of very primitive that you dig in and you make it now, especially in Los Angeles where everything is ephemeral, you dig it in and make it really part of, of, of the city and it's permanent and it um, mm, has all kinds of quasi-philosophical, religious digging and death and life and the, the earth surface is, is, is just loaded with, with meaning. And... Um, but it started with, the, with, the, with those, a fascination of those people, and that's a time when I'm still looking at everything. I'm just trying to figure out um, a role for me as an architect. And you're, just, you're absorbing bits and pieces of things. And then later, well, not that much later, well, no, um, at the beginning of the 90s, middle of the 90s, we're doing the school. Now it's full on. Now I'm interested in an in architecture of landscape. And I'm trying to diminish the building, but we couldn't quite get it there. Well, the, the Crawford House, ditto. And the Crawford wanted a, a villa, and we wanted to dig it. If you look at the model, it's only digging, but that's a lot to ask. They wanted like a, like a building. And uh, so it's a hybrid. And, uh, and then the school, we got closer, actually. We a public school with a super unusual client that let us do something that was kind of outrageous, actually. And, um, and then now it's a conscious idea that takes us all the way to Giant. And I'm still working with, we're working with it in the, in the Beirut. And um, one of my preoccupations is, is looking for this new hybrid that's um, where land, I, everything has to do with merging in my work, everything. Where you're merging and completely connecting landscape and building where they're indistinguishable. Because to me, I think, I don't know about Giant. Giant gets as close as I can get. We're building an architecture now simultaneous and I'm, develop, I'm developing some new morphology. Make sense? Process is everything. You were a creator. Oh, let me go one thing. If you look back at the competition for Vienna Expo, yes. that's where we full tilt. If you look at the models, the chunks of ground and building are one. And at that point, and then that goes back to how you develop as an architect. You're working on competitions, you're drawing, you're making models, you're rethinking things, you're tuning up for a future that you don't know exists yet. Because all of a sudden I look back now and I go, and, and when we did that and we made the model, you're, sometimes you're still not totally aware of it, but then you photograph it and look at it again and you go, oh, we did something here. There's no longer um, the tradition of figure ground. There's no ground. The ground that is active, the building is active, and we've completely merged it. And at that point we, met, we, we have an idea and it happened just before that with the um, a competition for, um, for the Quay in Paris, for Adis. And it came right before, and those two, now um, we had an idea that we were gonna work with the rest of our lives. Process is everything. You were a creator to me. Is that a linear process? And naively, I wanna ask, how do you choose from me? A process? In the, with the process models that you make, the reiterative models. How do you choose one? They're, they're, they're linear. You. Um, you're beginning a project and you're making certain hunches and you're defining what the, like connected to an earlier conversation, <clears throat> you're connected to, the discussion is what's the problem? You're not sitting down and drawing a, a formal idea. Um, what are the issues with this particular problem? Because um, we haven't talked about it, but um, very early on, um, we were interested in the radical specificity of architecture and how each project is unique to its own circumstances, and there's no such thing as a generic, it was attacking generic. And that 
we were attacking um, an aspect of modernism, and I used to show Hilbertsheimer, the housing, and that would, that would be, we're attacking that model. And, um, and so it's highly specific. We're sitting down and discussing a project, and we're discussing what is this particular project about? What are the, the opportunities that make it unique and interesting for us as architects? And, um, or that are defined by the nature of the problem by society, um, public, education, urban, whatever. Um, and you put the first idea down, and it starts incredibly simple. Just how big is it? What's this relationship to the site? Is it a big thing, a little thing? What are the problems that arise when you just put the massing and you come up with some quick ideas and you mass it? And the one thing we could agree upon, whatever it is, it's that amount of stuff. That's the answer. We can push it, we can move it, we can tall. And um, the, the competition we just did for Val's, same thing. We put a big mass in there and said, oh, this big hotel doesn't, doesn't cut it. Uh, really, really weird in this little village. And the first thing we said is, hmm, it seems like this is going to take us someplace different because just the massing is a problem. It's so out of scale with the village, no matter what we do. It doesn't matter if we shape it. And, um, and so we, we asked some questions and came up with a new massing, and we finally ended up with this little piece. But you keep talking about it and make another one. And today, with, um, in the digital environment and in the um, model-making environment, uh, automated, um, you, can, you can move it in the early phases of the conceptual. You can move quickly the way your, your mind, in the old days you'd make a model and you come back to it three days later and you, 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 your, your brain is like so far ahead of it because you're making a, a physical thing. And now at, at nine o'clock at night it goes into the machine and in, in the morning it's ready. You're looking at it after a good night's sleep. And you're drawing changes, it, back it goes. And you might do, in the far tower competition, we were doing two a day. Come out, spend an hour, go back in, talk about it again at seven o'clock, go back in, and you're just moving like this. And now you're talking about it within the broad terms of architecture. Um, and depending on the project, it's, it's, it's scale and massing and urban idea of open space, um, structural performance, mechanical performance, functional performances at all level, and you just keep, um, the idea of false solution or it's based on. You're never seeing something as a solution. You're seeing something, in, in, again, within um, a progression of time. That's, again, it's, it's, it's ephemeral. And um, the, the Popper's idea that this, it's not a solution, it's, it's a thing that, that, that you challenge, the false solution. And that started 25 years ago. And then you just keep developing them. And like all design processes, the end is where you've kind of exhausted your own ideas. And there's no longer kind of a relationship with the amount of time you're spending and where it's going. Or it's the end of the, the time framework. You, it's over. And, um, and if you put them together, they usually make total logic. You can see how it keeps, and it's also getting more specific. We're all, okay, all of a sudden on the far tower, on number 20, the skin shows up. Or on number 11, there's no skin still. It's just massing shape urban, infrastructural, et cetera, um, functional, things are in the right places. And the skin now, all of a sudden, it has some sort of a, a, a thing on it. But that's number 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever, right? And, and because the project's not, a, that's where skin belongs. It, it, it didn't arrive until now we're discussing that's where we are. And now the scale, the models are going up. We're looking at it more in a more finite sense. Make sense? I want to take it back a little bit. Yeah, but a little more thing. And also, um, as you're working with larger and larger teams, I've got a table of that, that seven people around the table, and we're all having this conversation, and then they're going back to work on this project. And it's part of an iter iterative, pro reiterative process, which is also about communication and an understanding that what the direction of the project is. What are the, pro what are the problems at this moment? Yeah? Um, I want to take it back a little bit, um, and also with Fred's introduction about you've always had naysayers, you've always been challenged, and uh, you talk about the notion of challenging critique. I wanted to understand when you say challenging critique, do you mean as a disciplinary thing or a public thing or a private matter? Challenging critique? Yes. Challenging critique itself? Yes. Hmm. 
the critique is a challenge. I'm trying to I'm not sure what the question is. Um, I mean, architecture comes out of a continuous critique, um, which is interrogating your own work. And um, I think one of the things that's so important as, as you develop leadership, first you're the leader, but there's, there's two people, and it's simple. And later the office is getting larger and larger, and you're developing another group of people that are leadership. Um, is leading the critique, which is the interrogation. I try to, um, we, we have a system of conversation that has to do with when a project leaves the office. And I think we have kind of a reputation that when things leave the office, they're developed at a certain level. You don't see stuff, sh and just don't let it get out. And we just keep going, right? And that has to do with a, just a, a, there's a decision on a kind of rigor and a toughness. It's funny, I'm known as a tough guy and a tough critic in schools, and I don't get it, because I'm going, would you say that about a surgeon or a lawyer? Or, I mean, no, I said, um, my job, it, it's the same in the, my office, is I go, no, um, if I'm not the toughest, if, if we're not tough on our own work, and if we're not really rigorous, and in investigating and in challenging our own work because we're only challenging it because we're, we're, we want something to come out that is the best that we can do and that deals with the problem at hand within contemporary terms. That, that's our job. I mean, that's, that's literally what the, any leadership group in an office, and that's how people advance in the office are ones that are willing to, to speak up and say, hmm, have we looked at this aspect of the work? Are we missing something? or there's a whole territory that we haven't covered here that has to do with some particular part of the building that allows us to further develop that piece of work. And I think schools are a little bit soft, that are, it's not useful to the profession, that it's not personal. It's not at all personal, it has nothing to do with it. It's, it's, we're not going out to dinner or playing golf, I mean, this is about work. And this is about looking at producing the, something that's that's worthy of your of your abilities, and um, I don't know any other way you could you could develop a piece of work that that comes without that in that that um, inter I'm going to say interrogation. It's a strong word. Uh, hmm. And I, for me, it's only a positive. It's not quite the opposite. It's the it's what's required. If we, if, if we were talking, if there were lawyers in this room, they would laugh, of course. If you're going to win the case, you have really investigated all of the aspects of, uh, of the approach, right? Of, of uh, how are you going to do that? Otherwise, you're, you're going to be in bad shape. For students and professionals that look at your work for inspiration or as a mechanism of learning, what would you ask them to focus on? Process. <clears throat> Not the work. The work by definition, can't belong to any place else. You can't copy Cooper. Cooper belongs to Cooper Union on that site at that period of time with that program in the East Village. Uh, I can lay every project. Um, Emerson did a very particular site, Hollywood sign, city behind us, housing on, on our Sunset Boulevard. Um, the, um, the thinking behind the project, the, um, the process that leads you to the work, that if you admire something, you want to know how did you get to that thing, not the thing. The thing is now gone. Um, and some of that we talked earlier might be, you could surmise some of it through the work itself, leaves some vestige of process, because there's a logic to it that you could work yourself backwards without talking to the architect. I'd ask you that question. If, if you looked at the work, would you yourself say, yes, I can kind of get a logic working backwards? and um, it's a secondary effect for me, but it's something I'm interested in as an educator, and that um, it's, um, I'm, I'm, I guess, proud, or I, I find it useful if the work is actually useful to young people, that they can read certain systematic thinking in the work, but it's uh, the process. Let's end on an anecdotal note. Could you take us back to 1972 and the atmosphere that was Cyarch?
at the time, and how has playing a crucial role in education affected you? Mm. Uh, yeah, it was a really unique time. It was um, couldn't be more different than what's going on today. Uh, the general political, cultural, social climate was much more in the mood for experiment, change. This country was going through, we were economically healthy, uh, and there were all types of changes and experiments going on um, that I mentioned earlier politically, cultural, um, forms of music, blah, blah, blah. They were all experimental. And there was a, seemed to be a very large constituency that was interested in that, that was going to be um, interested in the modern, interested in the contemporary world. It seems like today we have a, a smaller constituency and they're much more interested in something safer, looking at building something historical, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, within, and then, and then in Los Angeles, it was a very particular time. The art scene had shifted from New York to LA. Um, most of us were living in Venice. That's where the art scene was. That's where a lot of the architects were. And then there were the group of architects, some still here, um, that were very much connected to that world, the, 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 the Coy Howards and the Robert Mancurians. And they were um, edgier and willing to take more risks. It wasn't East Coast. Um, there was a, uh, a kind of radicalness and an edginess here that was kind of unique, unique to LA, and it, it was the place to be in the 70s. And it allowed Cyark even to take place. That the Cyark couldn't have happened without the conditions allowing it to happen. That's key. You could just go that'd be another one, like saying you look at a building, a copy of the building, somebody, oh, let's make a SIR and do it again. Not that simple. In fact, I would think today it'd be totally impossible. The students are looking for, you couldn't, I said it before, you couldn't find 40 people that go to a non institution that even exists, right? And, um, and so the conditions were ripe for the school to start. And the, the, the experimental mood here was just completely open. You could do anything. And that openness, had huge, huge effect on us. And uh, some of it was maybe not useful in that um, at that time I was very much championing autonomy, disconnectedness from the, 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 the more conservative business and world, and I could do that, which again would be, I think, difficult to do today. But it set up visions and um, a way of thinking that was allowed you a certain freedom, a huge freedom, that was unique and that I look back and it was um, lucky me that I was in this place at that time in history that um, I have no idea, nobody does, knows who you'd be under different circumstances. And, um, and then unbeknownst to me, um, I was part of starting an educational environment which grew and grew and here we are in, 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 in Cyark in a new room that um, somehow unexplainably produced, uh, institutionalized um, a certain kind of chaos or openness that is an oxymoron, uh, that definitely was located in the 70s. And it still has vestiges of that that uh, openness and that transparency and the, um, a very unusual collective energy that takes place here that's uh, evident in two weeks from now as they hang up the, the thesis projects. And um, that is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Anarchistic, just about, because we were joking to, institute, to institutionalize anarchism is a totally oxymoron, and somehow this place has come close to it, uh, trying this really odd balance between something that is actually strangely behind the scenes, um, highly organized in organizational terms and in financial terms, but 
keeps the environment free from that. Am I right? You were a student here, right? Yeah. Yeah. That somehow um, allows that freedom to exist and doesn't interfere with all the enormous vicissitudes of contingency and which, which ends architecture, right? That you have to somewhere go away and do something and then come back and now figure out how does that connect our earlier discussion? How do you merge your, your, your imaginative world in the hard-headedness of the real world in political and economic terms, et cetera, et cetera? You can't interview Tom and then not have a conclusion. If architecture was an or orchestra, Tom would write the music for it. He would then imagine the instruments that he would need to create that sound and then would invent those instruments. He would then take on those instruments and teach the people how to play them. After he teaches the whole orchestra how to play those uniquely invented instruments, he would grab the baton, step on the podium, and start directing the music. What a pleasure it's been to sit down with the architectural maestro himself. Tommy, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow, very nice end.